Welcome back to the Compass Podcast. Today on the show, we're joined by Jaron Melarud, a research analyst at Arcane Research focused on Bitcoin mining. We talk about Arcane's newest research report, how Bitcoin mining can transform the energy industry. Jaron, welcome to the Compass Podcast. Thank you so much for joining. I've been really enjoying the work that you've done this summer. Just like exploded onto the Bitcoin mining scene, honestly. Just some of the graphics that you put up for Arcane Research, some of your personal interest in the space. And I think you've had a really good eye and zeroing in on what topics people are interested in. And that'd be the intersection of energy, and Bitcoin mining. Today, we're going to talk about this new research report that Arcane Research and yourself just put out. And the topic itself is mostly focusing on Bitcoin mining's place in the energy industry and how Bitcoin mining can optimize the energy industry. Uh, so again, thank you for joining the podcast. Let's get a quick little bio from you before we jump into the conversation. There's lots to talk about today. Yeah, thanks uh, so much, Will. I'm uh, really, uh, really happy to be on this podcast. I've been uh, listening to the Compass podcast for two years now, and it's uh, taught me so much about Bitcoin mining. So um, I first became obsessed with uh, with Bitcoin after I saw the, how much money the central banks were printing uh, after uh, the lockdowns in 2020. And um, I remember seeing this chart of the extreme increase in the money supply, and I was just orange-pilled immediately. And I just decided to spend the following summer, the summer of 2020, to just to just study Bitcoin full time. And uh, during this time, I was studying energy management in university, and I had to write my master thesis. And I figured I become so uh, I so much liked to study Bitcoin mining, so I figured, okay, maybe I can write my master thesis on Bitcoin. And I thought that okay, Bitcoin mining consumes a lot of energy. I studied energy management. Okay, let's combine these two uh, topics. And I wrote my master thesis on Bitcoin mining as a demand response and uh, using ERCOT as a case study. And uh, I became uh, not only obsessed with Bitcoin, but I became more and more obsessed with Bitcoin mining. And uh, Arcane Research offered me a a full-time job as a research analyst, a crypto research analyst. Uh, but I f- mostly focus on Bitcoin mining. And I really love uh, working as a research analyst on Bitcoin mining, and I try to spend as much time as I can on uh, on that. Um, yeah, so that's what I do. And given my energy background, I uh, f- try to focus on Bitcoin mining and the energy markets. And... Um, I really believe that Bitcoin mining is a unique energy consumer and it can solve several energy problems. Most people, they disregard Bitcoin mining as just yet another energy intensive industry. But if you if you look deeper into how Bitcoin mining consumes energy, you will see that it's, it's a very unique energy consumer uh, that can actually be used as an energy tool to solve uh, some of the energy industry's biggest uh, problems. Nice. Gave me a perfect segue there. And I just want to say that we're going to definitely pump your bags here on the show because the stuff you've been putting out has just been excellent. And I don't think a lot of people are doing it. Let's dive into the report entitled How Bitcoin Mining Can Transform the Energy Industry. You can find it on Arcane Research. Just go to the website. We'll also be running a little summary version in mining memo. So check that out. Thank you, uh, Darren, for writing that. Let's start with the first line of conversation, talking about how Bitcoin mining fits into the energy industry. And the things that jumped out to me at the report was really the beginning of the, some of the five beneficial features of Bitcoin mining. The ones you list were price responsiveness, interruptibility, location agnostic, modularity, and it's portable. So we can go through those in order or however you want to tackle them. Uh, I like how you break down those features of Bitcoin mining. They're all true. And I think that as someone's learning about Bitcoin mining, they'll find that those things uh, are true in different ways, right? There, There's different ways to add load to the grid by adding S9s or adding S19s or some sort of efficiency there. The fact that you can pick these things up, either the miner or even the whole container, uh, that's pretty impressive. Uh, but let's just jump into it and talk about those five things. And then we'll continue to move through the conversation. 
Yeah, so uh, first is uh, Bitcoin mining is a price responsive load, meaning that it is financially incentivized to respond to changes in the electricity price. And that's because energy is about 80% of uh, operating cost of Bitcoin mining, uh, according to Cambridge University on average. So Bitcoin miners are constantly paying attention to their electricity prices. And if the electricity price reaches levels above the marginal cost of um, or the, the income per megawatt hour, the Bitcoin miner is financially incentivized to turn off its machines. And a Bitcoin miner always knows it's uh, it's this cost of um, of uh, shutting down production, while other industries they don't know it. For example, a cement producer they don't know how how uh, they don't know the, their alternative cost of not producing cement because it's a lot of different uh, processes involved in cement production. While in Bitcoin mining, you only do one thing, uh, solving the SHA-256 algorithm and you know exactly how much money you lose by not mining Bitcoin for one hour. So Bitcoin miners are very price responsive. And the second is interruptibility. It's about if Bitcoin miners actually can reduce their their energy consumption and how fast they can do it. And uh, as most listeners of this show knows, Bitcoin miners, uh, like turning off a Bitcoin mining machine takes a few like few seconds, click of a button, and uh, uh, you're you're able to turn off this machine. So, uh, and this interruptibility becomes very clear when comparing a Bitcoin miner to a data center, like for example, Facebook's data center. It is not an interruptible uh, load, while a Bitcoin miner is an interruptible load. Uh, and the combination of price responsivity and interruptibility means that Bitcoin miners are very good, uh, good d- demand response resources, which we can talk about uh, a little bit later. You also have location agnosticism. Uh, to mine Bitcoin, you only need energy, cheap energy and an internet connection, which practically means that you can mine Bitcoin almost anywhere in the world. You can mine Bitcoin in really remote areas, and this uh, this uh, factor means that Bitcoin miners are excellent consumers of stranded energy resources. You can't just uh, place a cement factory or another energy-intensive industry into uh, in the middle of the desert in Texas, but you can place Bitcoin mining facilities there to take off this excess energy. In addition, a Bitcoin mining operation is modular. A Bitcoin mining machine consumes a specific amount of electricity, which means that to scale this operation into exactly the amount of load you need, you only need to to, um, increase or reduce the number of uh, machines uh, you use. So um, if you have, for example, 5 megawatts of available energy, okay, then you can uh, can buy 1,500 Antminer S19s Okay, let's say you have 10 megawatts. Okay, then just uh, just scale it up to 3,000 megawatt, 3,000 Bitcoin mining machines. So you can always match your your available energy with an exact Bitcoin mining load, and that is is very very unique. Um, you also have port- portability. Bitcoin miners are portable operations. At least they can be be designed to maximize portability. Uh, you can build a Bitcoin mining operation into a into a containerized solution, which is uh, very easy to ship around, and uh, you can set up this uh, facility very easily. It's a plug and play solution. So in a lot of places, you don't know how long energy the energy will be in excess. Uh, for example, in uh, in northern Norway, where I'm from. Uh, energy here is very cheap because it's currently stranded. Uh, but with uh, high energy prices further south in Europe, there the energy companies are looking at increasing the transmission capacity between northern Norway and the rest of Europe, which might in time increase the energy prices in northern Norway. 
Um, but if you are worried about that as a Bitcoin miner, you can just uh, just uh, maximize the portability of your operation by building it in container containers, and you can ship your operation to another place with stranded energy if the transmission capacity increases here. So you have these uh, these uh, five properties. A price respon responsive, interruptible, location agnostic, modular, and portable. Uh, and it's it's actually really rare that other energy industries even have one of them. But Bitcoin mining has five of them. And that's really unique. And uh, it means that Bitcoin mining, uh, mining loads can be utilized to solve uh, several energy problems, for example, uh, stabilizing the, stabilizing the grid, um, consuming excess uh, renewable energy, stranded energy, and they can also um, uh, consume stranded uh, natural gas to mitigate natural gas flaring, um, and also you can reuse the heat from Bitcoin mining operations. Um, so you have all these things you can do. There's also uh, we wrote about this energy problems in our report but there are also many more you can uh, energy problems that bitcoin mining can help solve but we chose to focus on on these four uh, four problems totally and i i think every single one of these right has a depth to it that's also interesting in and of itself the the one that really speaks to me is the reaction time the fact that you can just turn off your machine immediately just by unplugging and give that energy back to the grid and if you think about it it's interesting because a lot of these other processes are energy intensive. They build on top of each other, right? So if Facebook unplugs, well, a lot of things that we're building up in order for them to do the compute are now offline and they have to go back from square one. For a concrete mixer, a concrete uh, manufacturer, a steel mill, same thing. Turn one thing off, turn off the whole site. You have to boot up in stages to get the whole thing on online again. Bitcoin mining is just one operation, SHA-256, finding the nouns. And it's not dependent on the prior nouns, right? It's not dependent on the prior compute. Right? It's just every single time it needs to do a compute, it starts over from square one and starts looking for the next nouns. So uh, I think you did a great job in this report looking through these, these five features. And every single one, like you said, can, has a depth to it. Let's talk about the non-flexible load portion of this because the, the report does an excellent job of going through it and showing like where there's non-flexible loads, where there's non-flexible energy sources, I should say, uh, why we need some sort of load that can contribute to the grid that is easy to turn off and on or portable. Uh, it can take up these energy sources. Uh, the report goes a lot into the fact that like solar and wind, a lot of times we have those energy sources in places where there's no transmission lines or there's no users of that energy. And we don't have battery technology there, but Bitcoin mining can sit in place of those and uh, consume that energy. And then later on in the conversation, let's definitely address the economics of it because I think this is where a lot of people get tripped up. They think, oh, well, if we build these things, then humans should be using them for human purposes. But Bitcoin mining enables, well, what you found in the report is that Bitcoin mining enables everyone to have better grids and more stable grids and then there's better economics because of Bitcoin mining. But we'll start with the first part about uh, non-flexible loads versus flexible loads and how the energy grid is built. Okay, so uh, historically the focus and or the main goal of building energy systems or electricity systems has been to maximize the energy security and the available energy. Uh, so you focused on building out a very, very reliable supply side of energy, which uh, consisted of uh, fossil fuels and nuclear power. But uh, now we see a shift where uh, policymakers focus more on uh, the, the cleanliness of the energy. So we see a massive shift from, from controllable energy sources, fossil fuels, which we control their output by just putting in more fuel when we need the energy. So we can actually control the supply side to non-controllable energy sources like wind and solar, which depend on the weather and we can't control the weather. So we really don't know when they will produce and when they will not produce. Uh, and um, energy system, electricity systems need uh, system flexibility 
which is the, the ability of the system to, to match the supply and the demand. And since before, historically, most of the, the system flexibility was provided by the demand side, no, no by the supply side. Uh, but as the supply side's flexibility decreases, as we integrate more wind and solar, uh, we increasingly need to, to use the demand side for providing this uh, system flexibility. And uh, the best, the best uh, source of system flexibility, of demand side flexibility, is Bitcoin mining. Bitcoin mining is the best demand, demand, demand response uh, resource that exists. Uh, simply because it's an interruptible process and the Bitcoin miners are price responsive. They're financially incentivized to respond to, to uh, high energy prices, which happen, happens during energy scarcity. So um, it's exactly because uh, we are, uh, we are um, building so much wind and solar that we actually need uh, more demand response capacity and uh, then Bitcoin mining is the best alternative. So, so uh, and, and another another problem which uh, when the increasing share of wind and solar uh, comes with is uh, energy waste. So you have both both these system stability challenge, which Bitcoin mining can help solve, and you have the energy waste challenge, which also Bitcoin miners can help solve. Uh, because uh, there are no other uh, no other uh, energy consumers which are so flexible with regards to when and where they consume electricity, so Bitcoin miners can go out to to uh, stranded uh, renewable energy in, for example, West Texas, and uh, consume the excess energy. So these uh, these projects uh, don't need to curtail their production, which they have to if they don't can sell to a Bitcoin miner. Um, and, um, yeah, you also have the, have the system stability issues, which are more local problems, which uh, Bitcoin miners can help solve. And we see this happening in Texas now, uh, and it's, it's working really well so far. Yeah. The summer has proven that as well, right? We saw a lot more Bitcoin miners hooked up to the grid, hooked up to the demand response and took advantage of that. Let's talk about the Paris Accords really quickly. It's interesting to see something like the Paris Accords, which I think a lot of Bitcoin miners would probably not agree with in the first place. They, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't sign off on it in the first place, but they're there, right? A lot of nations have agreed to these things. And this is sort of the architecture for most energy policies going forward for countries. Bitcoin miners actually fit really well into this policy framework because we need a large demand response to the grid. I think the research you did pointing to 500 gigawatts needed of demand response. Was it by 2030 or 2040? Uh, yeah, the uh, International a Energy Agency estimates that to reach the Paris Agreement, we need to increase the, the demand response capacity from 50 gigawatts currently to 500 gigawatts in uh, 2030, <laughs> which for me seems completely impossible, just like all the other of these climate goals they always make. Uh, but... Um, Bitcoin miners uh, are the best alternative for demand response. So, if uh, policymakers really are are uh, are serious about uh, this uh, Paris Agreement, they should uh, integrate more Bitcoin mining into the into energy grids. Yeah, let's walk through the, the logic of it. So, like we have, they want to add more wind and solar to the grid. We have this nice chart that's like up and to the right, a forty two percent increase in sustainable development by 2040, I think is the, the chart. We need to add all that wind and solar, but it's a non-flexible energy source. How does Bitcoin mining fit into that picture? Yeah, so Bitcoin mining, um, like actually I believe that uh, we also need, uh, I, I believe that such a large share of wind and solar uh, is uh, impossible without uh, creating big problems for the grids. And I don't think Bitcoin mining is a, like a, a quick fix a pill for for it, uh, but it can it can at least help. Um, so Bitcoin miners, what they are basically doing in energy grids is that they are increasing the base load of the energy grid, but they are not increasing the peak load. And the peak load is what is expensive to supply. And it's also the energy which is usually running on these peaker plants, which are 
emitting the most uh, most uh, greenhouse gases also so um bitcoin miners are not not increasing the peak load they're simply uh, increasing the 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 base load and this base load increase it incentivizes more generation on the grid uh, which uh, which uh, can lower energy prices for other consumers and also makes the the grids more secure because now you have more capacity that you can turn on in case of of a scarcity event um so um like bitcoin miners are are not uh, replacing the need for fossil fuels as some as some people uh, like to say we will still need this this uh, picker plants we will still need a, a base load of of uh, fossil fuels i think uh, but um but um I like to to look at it in the practical way, and I know that Bitcoin mining is helping the economics of wind and solar plants. So uh, why not why not combine Bitcoin mining with these wind and solar plants? It's uh, good for the economics of the developers of these plants. Uh, also, I believe that we have seen uh, a lot of the development of wind and solar in in the US the last few years has been due to production tax credits by the government, the federal government. Uh, so we might have seen actually too much development of wind and solar in, in uh, for example, West Texas. Um, but Bitcoin miners are sort of coming there to, to fix these central planning uh, problems that are, that are caused by central planners. And uh, I think that's a, that's a very good thing for everyone. Yeah, it's funny how Bitcoin's cleaning up like this fiat mistake. Of let's talk about the levelized cost of energy. The economics of this is really fascinating. I think this is the unintuitive part, right? So a lot of times we have these uh, natural resources we're building out. We're trying to claim wind or solar, trying to make it into energy. It costs money to develop those things, but oftentimes once it's built, it doesn't cost anything to produce it. Right? The marginal cost for them is zero, and then you send it out into the grid. You don't care how much people buy it for. You can bid down the market. And in some places, we even see the cost for that energy uh, during times being negative because of the credits and whatnot. That can hurt other markets that are also sending energy into the market saying, like, we want to spend this amount per megawatt hour uh, when we're selling into the grid. But they're competing against solar and wind, which have a 0% cost of producing this energy after a certain point. How does Bitcoin mining fit into this market disruption between these two sources of energy? How does Bitcoin mining perhaps fix the incentives for both parties and enable the grid to sell energy in a correct fashion? So uh, in uh, grids that are uh, mostly or have a very high share of wind and solar, you will see very volatile prices with periods of extremely low prices and when the wind and solar is producing and periods of extremely high prices when when uh, the wind and solar is not producing because then you will have energy scarcity because you don't have enough enough uh, controllable generation to to back up the the system and uh, if bitcoin miners come into these these areas they uh, they uh, increase the the electricity demand in the area which uh, which uh, can give uh, higher prices for these wind and solar projects they wouldn't need to curtail that much energy um, but it also incentivizes development of more uh, reliable base load plants in the area which is 100% needed uh, to to have energy security in the area Awesome. Yeah, I love the part about volatility because we've seen that in Texas, right? And I think sometimes we look at these economic thoughts, and we're like, this is all textbook conversation, but it's happening in Texas, right? Where we have really cheap energy during some parts of the day because the wind's blowing and the sun is shining, but other parts, it's not so cheap, right? The uh, example that you have in the research and probably most people think about is that winter storm in Texas in February of 2021, where the price of energy spiked. I think it's in the report is like nine thousand dollars per megawatt hour. Feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but that's the the number that I remember from the top of my head, and that's a huge increase, huge percent increase on the cost of energy. And it's because when we add these ener energy sources to the grid, they are very very volatile. So Bitcoin mining sort of fits in there and fixes these things. 
want to ask sort of a question from a different perspective. One thing you brought up in the report is, okay, if we have these energy sources that are stranded, they're far out in Texas or far out somewhere else where the population center is not, how do we get this energy sources to the people who need it? Or how do we capture these energy sources in a productive fashion? The few things that you noted were batteries, transmission line construction, or moving population centers or the energy center closer to the people who need it. Obviously, the third one's really tough to do. I'm not going to pick up Houston and move it deeper into Texas. And you need transmission lines to get the energy sources closer. That's very expensive. And the last one, battery technology, we're not quite there yet. There's some work on that front, but we're probably you know, 10 to 50 years away from figuring that out. How does Bitcoin mining fit into that? And what do you say to the critique that why are we investing in Bitcoin mining? We should be investing in battery technology and transmission lines. And we're, we're missing out every day. We don't do that. Yeah, so in the West Texas, like the only, and in other areas with a lot of stranded renewable energy, the only way to get this energy to the population centers is to transport it through transmission lines. So you need to increase the transmission line capacity. And that's generally very expensive and it takes a lot of time to build these transmission lines. And uh, I wouldn't say that Bitcoin miners are competing against these uh, transmission projects because Bitcoin mining is a very competitive industry. And in, uh, in, popul- in areas with a lot of energy demand, for example, let's say Europe, uh, energy prices are so high that miners can't compete with the, the local demand there. So you need, uh, so if let's say in Norway, we have stranded energy in Northern Norway, uh, even if we had a lot, we have a lot of mining in Northern Norway, but they would still build transmission lines because the, the energy market in the South part of Norway and Europe has a much higher willingness to pay for this energy than Bitcoin miners. So they would out compete Bitcoin miners on the price they're willing to pay. So. Uh, I think uh, I think in uh, in uh, in areas with a lot of stranded energy, you will have uh, transmission line development sooner or later. But in the meantime, you can you can always monetize this energy by mining Bitcoin, and it's better than wasting energy. I think everyone should agree with that, even if you believe Bitcoin is a waste, which some people believe. And when it comes to to batteries. Bitcoin is not a, a com- competitor to batteries either because um, batteries store energy while Bitcoin miners don't store energy. So they don't uh, really compete at all. And Bitcoin mining can actually be, uh, be um, combined with batteries. We see some, some, uh, some uh, projects, for example, I believe Square was, uh, is uh, trying to build a combined the battery bitcoin mining and uh, solar project um because batteries have limited the capacity storage capacity so uh, what you go- what are you going to do when the battery is full and you still have a lot of energy generated by your wind or solar plant then you might as well just let this energy flow into the bitcoin mining operation and uh, when it comes to the f- the capital directed to bitcoin mining is competing against the w- development of batteries i don't think it's a good argument at all it's like uh, uh yeah it, it's like saying that uh yeah it, it's it's a stupid argument i i don't buy that <laughs> argument <laughs> <That's> <laughs> of course right. all capital uh, c- competes against other capital yeah 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 no, that's a perfect way of leading it right there, right? We don't necessarily need to uh, debunk every stupid argument that pops up. Let's move over to the three operating models of Bitcoin mining with renewables. I found this to be a really fascinating part of your research. And for anyone who's following along, I think it's on uh, page 47. So we have a few different models. We have grid connected, behind the meter, and behind the, behind the meter, high uptime, and behind the meter, low uptime. Uh, we also find in this, and I always want to highlight this so we get into the conversation, that there's different uptime percentages that are best for Bitcoin miners who are using renewable energy. 
based on the fact that renewable energy has very volatile price hikes and price spikes. And sometimes it's really cheap. So let's go through those three models. And then I'd like to get a little note in on like the different percentage uptimes uh, as I think that's a counterintuitive way of thinking about mining to most people. Okay. Yeah. So most people believe that a Bitcoin mining operation needs to be running 100% of the time, but it's totally false. Uh, a Bitcoin miner can actually make much more profit if they if they exploit the interruptibility of the their operation and uh, reduces the uptime from, let's say, 100% to 98% or 95%. And the reason is that in uh, many electricity markets, particularly those with a high share of wind and solar, due to the volatility of the power prices, you have a skewed uh, price distribution. So most of the time you have very low prices. Like in, this is happening in Texas. Most of the time, very low prices. And a few percent of the hours of the year, you have extremely high prices. And most energy consumers they have to use electricity during this whole price distribution, even in, when uh, in the very expensive hours. Bitcoin miners can very easily turn off their machines, so they can simply uh, not uh, not consume energy during the highest priced hours of the year. And this is how Bitcoin miners, like for example, a riot in Texas, achieves such low power prices. Riot achieves much lower power prices than most other grid grid connected customers in Texas because they are able to reduce their their uptime just a little bit. And this little bit reduction of uptime can reduce their power prices by by uh, like twenty, thirty, forty percent. Um, so, uh, this model, which uh, Riot is doing is, uh, if you look at the three operating models, is grid connected with high uptime. So this is around 98% uptime. They are buying uh, energy in the spot market and selling ancillary services to the, to the grid, which is demand response services. Um, so we saw a riot this summer. They uh, participated in the 4CP program, which they in, they need to reduce their electricity consumption during a uh, few hours of the most, uh, like when the energy when the energy is very scarce during the summer. And uh, by doing this, they receive energy credits, which reduces their average price of energy uh, during the following year. This is uh, strengthening the electricity grid. And in this setup, you need to have uh, have uh, or th the most economical uh, way to do it is to use uh, use uh, efficient energy efficient models, and that's what uh, Riot and most other uh, publicly listed miners do. And then you have a, a model in the middle here, which is around has around ninety five percent uptime, maybe up to ninety eight percent. This is behind the meter with high uptime behind the meter means that you're uh, you're co-located with a renewable energy generator and this renewable energy generator can uh, can uh, choose between selling the energy to the bitcoin mining facility or selling the energy to the grid but in this case you can also uh, use the, use the energy from the from the grid and uh, in this case you should should uh, you should uh, create the bitcoin mining facility it has a smaller load than the than the renewable energy generator because of the the low capacity factor of renewables uh, you can also choose to have uh, behind the meter with the lower uptime the uptime in this setup will uh, will uh, vary considerably uh, but in this case, you are uh, you are uh, using older machines, which are very cheap, very low capex, and uh, generally the cheaper machines you use, the lower uptime you can handle, and uh, the more renewable energy you can use because of the low capacity factor of renewables. So if you if you are connected to um, if you are connected behind the meter, you can't uh, you can't expect hundred percent uptime. Because one, the low uh, renewable energy has low capacity factor, and uh, two, it's not just not economical. 
because as uh, as i mentioned uh, energy price distribution is skewed so you you want to avoid the the few hours with with really expensive energy yeah i love how you put that and the one thing i would add just for for clarity as well as well as like there's a lot of benefits for every miner who's hooked up to this sort of grid system where there is demand response and where you are selling back to the grid the overall cost of your energy goes down so even if you're not getting like credits often you are getting a lower rate in the first place just because uh, the company itself is responding to demand on the grid and lowering down uh, or turning off when demand is high. Uh, unless we have anything else to add there, I think we should turn to the last part of the research report, which is talking about some of the externalities, the positive externalities of Bitcoin mining, uh, particularly like the heat offload that's created from Bitcoin mining, and then also the consumption of flared gas. So. We'd spend a few minutes on both those topics. Uh, flared gas and Bitcoin mining is probably the place to start since we're still talking about energy sources. We've had this conversation a lot on the podcast. As you know, we've had a lot of flared gas miners on the podcast. What was your takeaway from doing a deep dive into the research zone? You know, looking at all the, the gas flare operations out there. What did you think about them currently? What do you think like the runway is for these flared gas miners? And Last question, if I can throw three at you at the same time, is how do you think public perception of these flare gas miners is at the moment? Is the energy industry actually taking this seriously or do they think it's just sort of a nice pet project? I think mitigating natural gas flaring with Bitcoin mining is uh, probably the most promising, I would say, uh, way of utilizing Bitcoin mining as an energy tool because it shows really how much synergies Bitcoin mining has with the energy industry. Um, the energy industry, the oil producers can both increase their revenues by doing this because they don't have to just waste this gas. They can actually sell the gas and they can uh, reduce emissions, which is increasingly important uh, for these companies. And uh, I believe that the oil producers are really taking this ser seriously. We saw, for example, even a Norwegian energy producer, which is like Equinor, which is really into ESG and everything like that. They they did this, and what what I think is so cool is that actually ESG is pushing this uh, these energy producers into Bitcoin mining, uh, while you would think that ESG was preventing uh, energy producers from mining Bitcoin, but it's actually <laughs> it's actually the opposite. So. Um, just because uh, of the extreme emission reduction, you see that those people who actually, those environmentalists who actually care about reducing emissions, because not everyone really, uh, of them really care about that, uh, they actually uh, actually um, uh, they actually are really easy to uh, to uh, like when I talk to them about this, they really easily understand this. Uh, like for example, uh, Daniel Batten, he's an environmentalist. He's he loves this idea of Bitcoin mining, uh, mitigating uh, emissions by by uh, preventing gas flaring. And uh, we see a massive growth of this during the last two years, and the growth is really accelerating. With for example, Crusoe Energy pushing into the Middle East. Um, and who knows how much uh, how mu much energy companies are really doing this in Russia, for example. Um, and the amount of natural gas flared uh, globally each year is enough to power the entire uh, continent of uh, sub-Saharan Africa. So there's so much energy out there in natural gas flaring. And I, I really believe that this is going to become a really significant part of the Bitcoin mining network in a few years. Right now, I heard estimates around between 2% and 5%, so it's not really big yet. But I think we're going to see see massive growth in this simply because, uh, because it's so sy synergistically between the energy companies and the Bitcoin mining companies here. No, definitely. I uh, love talking with everyone in the flare gas industry for Bitcoin mining. They're always interesting people who have like connected the dots between two industries in a different way. I would even estimate that it's probably lower than that. Like probably less than 1% is some of the conversations I've had. It's very small, like very, like 2% is also very small. 
Uh, so there's a lot of growth there. And I think the graphics that you put together in this research report, especially the maps showing the flared spots all around the world, shows you how much promise there is in this part of Bitcoin mining's energy future. Let's turn over to the heat portion of this. Uh, you had some great information about how the external heat or the heat that Bitcoin miners put off can be used as a positive externality. We have a few examples like Mint Green, I think, is powering par portions of Vancouver using uh, excess heat from Bitcoin miners. We've all seen the photos of like uh, greenhouses, there's you know potato sellers, things like that being warmed by Bitcoin miners. How much of a conversation topic is this for people in the energy space? Is it, again, sort of just like a side conversation that people are like, oh, this is a nice positive externality, but it's not going to lead to much? Or do you think this is an underrated factor when it comes to discussing Bitcoin's energy future? I can tell you that uh, in Norway, all miners are either developing solutions for this right now or talking about it. And th th I think also it's a very underrated topic. Uh, I think it's it's one of the most promising uh, ways Bitcoin miners can help the, help solve energy problems because heat is a very big uh, user of energy. It's the almost uh, accounts for almost half of the global energy consumption. So uh, by by re repurposing the heat from Bitcoin mining, which is heat that otherwise would just be wasted, you essentially have free heat. Um, and uh, most Bitcoin miners operate in places where heat is not that valuable. So they like I can imagine in Texas, no one talks about this. <laughs> But in uh, in northern Norway, northern Sweden, I talked to some miners in Finland who were re re reusing their excess heat. You know, it's really cold in Finland, even colder than in Norway. So, um, and you can use it for all kinds of purposes. You can use it for district heating systems like Mint Green does in Canada. Um, in Norway, we don't have that much district heating systems, but you can still use it for food production, like these massive greenhouses. Uh, you can use it for salmon farming. I know a few salmon farms in northern Norway that probably uh, could be interested in this uh, after a while. And there's, uh, there's a miner in Norway, which is uh, called Bit Zero in northern Norway. They're currently developing a massive greenhouse in northern Norway, which will reuse heat from their Bitcoin mining operation. And this heat, uh, this uh, greenhouse, uh, such a large greenhouse would not be be uh, possible to construct without the, the free heating from the Bitcoin mining operation. Because in northern Norway, northern Sweden, northern Russia, northern Canada, the whole northern uh, part of the world, there are almost no greenhouses, big greenhouses. And the reason is because uh, it's so cold there. So it's very, very expensive to heat these greenhouses. But Bitcoin mining actually makes it possible to build very big greenhouses there. And uh, this can increase the food security in the region, which I believe is very important. Uh, so... Um, and you don't even need, need such a big Bitcoin mining load to build a big greenhouse. That's what's also really interesting about this. Yeah. No, the whole thing, you sound very uh, bullish on it, more so than I was expecting. It makes sense too, right? You, you better the economics of the whole system. If you can just plug in a few ASICs on a decent power cost, then you're lowering the total cost of your operation. So like your greenhouse has a complement revenue stream to it. We've seen a few... Bitcoin miners for Compass and other Bitcoin miners I've talked to in the space are doing this. Like they're not really interested in the Bitcoin mining portion as much as getting the economics of their other project uh, into like the parameters they want. They want their revenues to make sense. And so they create two revenue streams and they add a positive externality, like the heat from Bitcoin mining and maybe even better their own operation. The coolest one I really want to look into and perhaps have them on the podcast is these Idaho potato farmers who are using Bitcoin mining to uh, warm their sellers during the cold winter months, and they're able to keep their potato operation running year round. Uh, it's not the most sexy part of any sort of Bitcoin operation, but it's definitely one of the most interesting side parts that uh, I think has popped up over the last two, three years. 
Yeah, absolutely. And uh, what is also interesting is that this can increase the decentralization of the Bitcoin mining network because where heat is uh, nowhere, electricity is expensive. Heat is usually also expensive. So that can reusing the excess heat can make it possible to construct a Bitcoin mining facility in places where it is very expensive for electricity. For example, in Central Europe, and you you sell the heat and uh, you have two income streams from Bitcoin mining and from selling the heat that can offset the expensive electricity prices you pay. And uh, of course, this is a much more complicated way to mine Bitcoin than just plugging it in and drawing electricity from the grid. Uh, But uh, I believe that in the long term, to survive as a Bitcoin miner, you have to solve at least one energy problem um, because solving energy problem, an energy problem will help you lower your electricity cost. That can be uh, mitigating natural gas flaring, repurposing the excess heat, using stranded uh, stranded energy resources that otherwise would be wasted, or providing these demand response services. Uh, so that the, the the time for just being a passive Bitcoin mining energy consumer, which has no real energy strategy, is uh, I think is over with this this bear market. I think now miners are all miners will be forced to to at least uh, to participate more actively in the in the energy markets. That's a really interesting thought. A nice compliment to what we're talking about right now. And it makes sense, right? You need to be solving multiple things. And in doing that, you create like more positive externalities for the energy creator for what other other markets that Bitcoin miners jump into. I guess we have about three, four minutes left here. I want to get two more questions to you. First one is, what do you think about the impact of reports like this and how they move into uh, the right people's hands? So what has these journalists not really doing a lot of research, might just throw out a headline about Bitcoin mining, sucking up all the world's energy. How do you think these research reports are taken? And what do you think Bitcoin miners out there can do to better the understanding of both these markets, the economics of Bitcoin mining and the positive externalities? So this uh, this uh, energy FUD debate, it's, uh, as I guess you also think, is really irritating debate, but we yeah. have to fight it. <laughs> and... <laughs> and uh, there's mainly two groups you need to convince. Uh, you don't need to convince the trolls because they would, will not be convinced and they only want to irritate us. So you need to convince two groups. First, it's just normal people who, uh, who uh, don't really know that much about energy. We're not experts on energy or not experts on Bitcoin. Those people can only be convinced by by explaining them the value of Bitcoin, making them understand why Bitcoin is worth spending energy on. So you need to focus on the positive sides of Bitcoin, not the energy consumption here. The second uh, second group to convince uh, is the energy industry, energy professionals. And to convince them, you don't need to, to convince them of the value of Bitcoin as a, as a payment system. You only need to convince them of the value of Bitcoin as an energy tool. How can it help the energy industry? How can it solve energy problems? And this group is what we focused on in in uh, this report. Um, and I also think it's most most interesting to focus on this group to educate the energy industry, because uh, I believe educating them is the best way to to uh, to win this energy fud debate, because the energy industry is the world's largest industry. And um, it's a very powerful industry. So getting them behind Bitcoin is really, uh, if we get them behind Bitcoin, the energy for debate is basically over. So I believe the energy industry will be very important, uh, Im- important supporters of Bitcoin as Bitcoin becomes a bigger and more important part of society. There we go. Okay, last question for you. You've probably heard this one a few times. What is your prediction for network hash rate by the end of the year? So you have about five months left or so. And luckily, like you have the hindsight or you have all the uh, benefits of hindsight that a lot of other people did not have. Curious to get your take. Are you super bullish, breaking past 250, staying below it? Where, where are we at? 
Uh, I guess uh, 240. 240, okay. Noted bull. There we go. Uh, I'm still like 249. Price are right rules, so anything below I get. But I, I don't think I've seen anyone over 275 since about May. Most people have been uh, pretty scared. At the beginning of the year, I think I had one person say 350x hash. So that was wow. that was pretty impressive. We're not not anywhere. Yeah, anywhere. We will, we'll see if the public miners are able to plug in all their incoming hash rates. Then uh, yeah. it might increase. There's definitely a lot of in the Bitcoin out. price. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see what happens with that. A lot of hash rate sitting on shelves waiting to be plugged in and a lot of new machines being deployed like S19XPs are finally being deployed, which is probably going to add a decent amount of hash rate with uh, the, the extra benefits of the efficiency and power output. So we'll see where we get by the end of the year, but great to get that. Uh, also great to have you on the podcast. Thank you so much for joining. For anyone who wants to look at this report or look at your information, where can they find you? So... Uh... You can find this report on arcane.no. It's arcane with a C. And you can find me on Twitter, J Mellerud, with two L's there on Twitter. And be aware of the impersonators. They're out there and there are many. You got good content. Everyone's trying to copy you. Uh, thanks again for joining us on the podcast. Talk yeah, to you. Thank you so much for having me.